Good afternoon, everyone. We're glad you could join us for this uh, second study of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, in our previous study, we introduced this particular gospel, and we also uh, considered verses 1 through 13 of chapter 1. In this study, uh, we will pick up the discussion in verse 14 and continue through the end of chapter 1. When we introduced the Gospel of Mark, we talked about the fact that it does seem directed toward uh, those that would be of a non-Jewish background. Mark, throughout his Gospel, explains certain things that are characteristic of the Jews or their practices or their language. And so this leads to the conclusion that Mark was writing particularly for uh, a Greek-oriented audience. We also noticed that Mark uh, is a very action-oriented gospel, that we find more in this gospel about Jesus' activities, uh, his healings, uh, his interactions with others, than we actually find dialogue. Not that dialogue is totally missing, but it would be very different, say, than the gospel of John. The gospel of John contains much more of the words of Jesus than we will encounter in the Gospel of Mark. We also notice that Mark begins his Gospel not with uh, a birth story of Jesus. He picks up his consideration of the life of Jesus as an adult. Actually, he doesn't begin with Jesus. He begins with John the Baptist. So if you begin reading uh, early in chapter 1, Mark is giving uh, an overview of the work uh, of John, his place as the forerunner, the herald uh, of the Savior, the Messiah, the anointed one who would be coming after him. And then we also notice that John uh, baptized Jesus. John was practicing a baptism of repentance unto the remission of sins and calling upon people to confess their sins and turn away from them and thus prepare their minds, and their hearts for the coming of Jesus, which raises an interesting question as to why Jesus came for baptism. Obviously, he did not have the same need for it uh, as those he came to save, and we discussed this at some length last time. We'll not review it uh, here. But Jesus said to fulfill all righteousness, as Matthew records. Uh, he um, insisted that John baptize him even when John uh, was reluctant to do so. We also find that Jesus, after his baptism, went into the wilderness where he fasted for a 40-day period uh, and afterward uh, was tempted by the devil. Again, we discussed this last time. We'll not go into details here. But Jesus begins his work in this very graphic way of Satan approaching him in a vulnerable state uh, that is physically vulnerable. Jesus still is God. He is deity. But that doesn't mean he's impervious to temptations and the sensations of the human body as it goes through certain rigorous uh, situations like fasting for over a month. And so Jesus uh, withstands these temptations. Again, Matthew uh, chapter 4 has more detail than Mark includes. But Jesus begins his ministry really with a hint of where this is going, and that hint is he's going to be victorious over Satan. He's not going to succumb to temptation and sin and thus spoil the perfect sacrifice that God wanted him to make uh, for all people for all time. And so this is the way Mark begins. He jumps right into the middle of the story. He talks about John's baptism and his uh, heraldry of Christ, and then he gives us the very briefest introduction into the beginning of Jesus' ministry. If you have your notes handy, I want to notice with you under point one some harmony notes. And I, I indicated last time that we're going to bring out certain harmony details when I think it will help us to understand the story as it unfolds. Um, not all of the gospel writers, of course, include every detail about the life of Jesus. It's only when we study uh, in a harmony format, that is, we take all the gospels and put them together and try to recreate something of a chronological order, do we begin to see uh, how much one author may omit. And it's not that he 
perhaps didn't realize those things happened that he left out. But, but each of these writers are writing for a particular purpose or a, to a particular audience. So they don't always include the same details that another gospel writer might. And so what we see here between verses 13 and 14 of the Gospel of Mark is that an entire section of the ministry of Jesus has been omitted. That section is what is commonly called the early Judean ministry. That is, after Jesus was baptized uh, and he made a trip back to Galilee, then he came back down to Judea and did a number of things in and around Jerusalem. The Gospel of John is the one that includes this particular uh, phase of Jesus' ministry that's omitted by the synoptic writers. Those would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so in our notes, let's just review what has not been said by Mark or what's been skipped over by Mark. And I think it will help us to understand some other things that take place in this chapter to realize what has been omitted. So the first chapter of John's gospel where Jesus first meets his future apostles. This is omitted by Mark. So we find out in John 1 that Jesus went into the wilderness uh, for the temptation that Matthew mentions and Luke mentions. But then he comes back to John at the Jordan. And it's at this point that John begins pointing him out as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Behold, look at him. He's the one. And as John does that, certain of his disciples become intrigued and interested by Jesus. And so they begin to follow him. In John chapters 2 through 4, we have a lot of other details of what happens during this early Judean ministry. For example, Jesus cleanses the temple for the first time. John chapter 2 verses 13 through 22 contain that particular episode. He goes into the temple and finds that it's been corrupted by money changers and those selling sacrifices, and it's been turned into a marketplace. Uh, and, and he's highly indignant and offended because of this. And so he takes a whip and drives the animals and the money changers out of the temple, overturning their tables and scattering their coins. And this leads to a challenge of Jesus. Uh, about his authority to be doing such things. So after that, Jesus works other signs during uh, this Passover trip that he makes to Jerusalem. John 2, verses 23 through 25, speaks of various miracles that he did, though they're not enumerated for us. Then in John 3, verses 1 through 21, Jesus has a detailed discussion with Nicodemus, who is a member of the High Jewish Court or the Sanhedrin Council, and Nicodemus has sought him out uh, for conversation. He wants to know more about Jesus, and so that discussion takes place. John 3, verses 22 and following, tells about Jesus and his disciples baptizing uh, many in the area of Judea, sort of as a parallel to what John is doing. And then in John chapter 4, as Jesus is heading from Judea back to Galilee, we find the uh, discussion with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and revealing uh, her immoral living situation. And this is the occasion in which Jesus is first identified by a human being as being the Christ or the anointed one. And it's actually the testimony of a Samaritan woman. Again, a very unusual thing for God uh, to do. But nonetheless, this is God's plan in revealing Jesus to the world really in a very humble and low-key way. So all of these things occur before the disciples are called to follow Jesus on a full-time basis. That leads to the first question in our lesson. How is Andrew described in the first chapter of John? How did he come to have such confidence in Jesus at this early stage? Well, Andrew, who is the brother of Simon Peter, Andrew is a young man of great spiritual interest. We find that he's a disciple of John already. And he's spending time with John at the Jordan as John is baptizing. And when John points out Jesus as the Lamb of God 
who has come to take away the sin of the world. Andrew is intrigued by that, and he ends up going and finding Peter and bringing him to introduce him to the Lord. The confidence that Andrew had at that point had nothing to do with Jesus' miracles or any personal knowledge of Jesus. It had to do with one thing, and that was John's testimony. And so Andrew demonstrates that the Jews should have and could have listened to John and respected him as a prophet and then allowed themselves to be introduced to Jesus, their Savior and Anointed One, as John's purpose was, to be a herald uh, of Jesus Christ. The second question, how did many in Jerusalem respond to these miracles of Jesus early on, John 2, 23? Well, they believed, although it says the belief was something of a shallow character. It says Jesus did not entrust himself to them. It was premature for one thing, and their belief, as we're going to see through the unfolding of Jesus' life, really did not run very deep. And so Jesus does not gain any kind of a very serious foothold uh, in, in, in and around Jerusalem during his ministry. Well, with that introduction in mind, again, just remember that when we begin reading in verse 14 of John 1, there's been a lot, sorry, of Mark 1, there's been a lot that's already taken place. And Mark omits that. And again, it helps to shed some light on some things that will happen. Let's read 14 and 15 of Mark 1. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. A couple of things to notice about these verses. Number one is the very quick notation of Mark that John, after John was put in prison, then Jesus came to Galilee. This, this is something that uh, Matthew concurs with in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Uh, John had sort of been the lightning rod, and he had been resisted and rejected in his prophetic work by the Jewish leadership, and being put in prison is a reference to Herod imprisoning John uh, because of his preaching and because it wasn't uh, so friendly toward Herod, and, and John was condemning uh, Herod's marriage to Herodias as being something unlawful. And so by Herodias's pressure and scheming, John is arrested, and it seems that Jesus knows this is going to be a problem for him. The focus is now going to be on Jesus, who's beginning to eclipse John and, and his baptism, and this had led to some friction with John's disciples. But when John is put in prison and Jesus realizes that the spotlight will be more so on him, he withdraws from Judea and makes his way back up to Galilee. And this is the beginning of, of the phase of Jesus' life called the Great Galilean Ministry. And theologians have attached that title to this phase of Jesus' life because it really is the greatest portion of his work on earth. It's where he spends most of his time. He's going to be deeply involved in teaching and in healing people, uh, in becoming very well known to the populace in and around the Sea of Galilee and in the, the area, the territory of Galilee. And so this is the commencement of this period called the Great Galilean Ministry. And as Jesus went to Galilee and began preaching, uh, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is fulfilled. All of what the Old Testament was pointing to, all of the work of the prophets that spoke, yes, to their own generation, but by extension, they spoke about an undefined future when all of these various things that they talked about in their prophecies would actually take place. They're all foretelling, in one form or another, the coming of the Anointed One or the Messiah. And now when Jesus and John before him when they begin preaching in this particular period, they are using this terminology, the time is fulfilled. Now is the right time. Now is the time that God has set for this preaching to be done and redemption to be provided for men. Keep in mind, there has been about 400 years past where God has said nothing. There were no uh, revelations through prophets, no inspired words. Uh, none that have been uh, kept for us 
in, in a written fashion, recorded for us. If God did speak during that time, it was oral and not recorded. But generally, this period leading up to John's work and now the work of Jesus is called the 400 years of silence because God really didn't have anything to say during that period, perhaps other than what he indicated would happen during that span of time by Daniel's prophecies. And so the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. I'll just make the side note here and not go into it deeply, but according to premillennial doctrine, uh, the kingdom wasn't established by Jesus after this. And they teach that the kingdom was rejected by the Jews. If, if that's true, and it certainly is not, but if it were true, it would mean Jesus is mistaken in what he's saying here. The time wasn't at hand. It wasn't the right time. It was not an appropriate time to come. The Jews' hearts were hardened. They did not want to open up to Jesus. And so right off the bat, premillennialism falls flat on its face because it's a denial of the very words of Jesus. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's either true or false. And we submit that it's true and that premillennialism is false. And so like John, Jesus calls upon his hearers to repent and believe in the gospel. And that gospel is the good news about himself. Well, let's continue. Verses 16 through 20 is the call of his first apostles. Uh, they will be apostles. At this point, they're only um, devoted followers. The actual bestowal of apostleship will come later. But beginning in verse 16, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Now this is where I believe having uh, a, a harmonious view of the gospel accounts is very helpful to us. Because Mark's account, if we do not have any supplemental information, makes it sound like Jesus merely walked by as a stranger and saw these, these four men, two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew and James and John, and just sort of mystically said, follow me, and they just sort of rose up in a trance and followed. And that's just simply not the way it happened. When we delve into the details, as we've already done with John chapters 1 through 4, the Gospel of John, what we've already seen is that the disciples have been with Jesus. They've seen him work miracles. They've heard him teach. They've traveled with him before this time. When Jesus here calls them as permanent followers, he's merely giving them the opportunity they've been looking for. They've been waiting for. They want to follow Jesus. And so when he finally issues the call, they are ready to rise up, leave their business, the fishing business, and follow after Jesus. There's a characteristic word here that we mentioned in our last study of the Gospel of Mark, and it's the word immediately. We see it several times in our study today. So in verse 18, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Verse 20, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee. And so this word immediately is probably the, the character, characteristic word of the Gospel of Mark, like the word better is of the book of Hebrews. Immediately is telling us in rapid fashion what Jesus does and how he goes about his work and how his life unfolds. It's an action-packed book rather than a book of discourses, as we said earlier. And so now, these two sets of brothers, and we know they were fishermen, they were not aristocrats. They were not of the, the intelligentsia class. Uh, they were not the well-learned, though it doesn't mean they were ignorant. They just simply weren't from the scholastic group. And they weren't from Jerusalem. They were from Galilee. They were from the backwater. They were from Nowheresville. And so, Jesus is continuing God's plan of acting outside the norm of doing things very differently than what we might expect as human beings, which is a warning to us not to attempt to assume what God may think about things. We need to stay with what God has said and revealed in his word. 
But these four men now become permanent disciples or followers. As we said, they'll be named apostles at a point later on. But picking up our reading again in verse 21, let's go further. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. This is taking place in Capernaum, and if you're familiar with a, a, a map of the times, especially Galilee, Capernaum is a small fishing village, uh, one of the larger towns in the area, but by comparison to others, not a huge city, but located on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and this is where Jesus will spend the majority of his time during the great Galilean ministry, at least it's sort of a headquarters for him. We're going to find out more about Jesus in this town than we will find out about him in any other uh, particular locality. And so it says that they were in Capernaum, that is Jesus and the early disciples with him. It was the Sabbath day and he entered the synagogue and taught. So let's make just an observation here about the Jewish synagogue. Jewish synagogues become very important in the New Testament, both to Jesus and the work that he does uh, in them and in conjunction with them, and also in the work especially of Paul. As Paul goes from city to city preaching the gospel, he often starts in the synagogue and preaches to the Jews there first. It brings up the question to us, where did synagogues arise and when? Because we don't read about them in the Old Testament. Well, like Pharisees and Sadducees, which we don't read about in the Old Testament either, synagogues just seem to, to be there. When we begin reading in the New Testament, they're there and there's no uh, explanation given as to a time or place of origin. It's mainly speculated that they arose during the time or maybe even somewhat before the time, but especially during the time of the captivity, when the temple was not available, it had been torn down and burned, and the people of Judah were living far away from it anyway. And so, very likely during this period of time, again, the majority of this period being what we call between the Testaments, or during this period of silence, that during that time, the synagogues became a substitute place of worshiping God, reading scripture, uh, praying, singing hymns, and so a place of worship. And so there really isn't anything more definite than that in Scripture as to the origin of the synagogue, but it's a very important element of Jewish life, and it's an important element in the life and in the work of Jesus. And so we have one example here of a healing on the Sabbath day. Though it is not stated that that became an issue, we will see later on that Jesus' healing on the Sabbath does become a major sticking point between him and the Pharisees. But it is the Sabbath day. He's in the synagogue. And first of all, it says the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. Well, we who believe in the divine nature of Jesus understand that observation. Jesus taught with authority because he's the one that actually gave the law to begin with. So his comments on the law would come from the, the perspective of certainty and authority and understanding the intent of law rather than the scribes and the Pharisees who merely observed and made human-based comments on what the law was teaching, mixing it in with all of their traditions even at that. And so the first thing is the people are astonished at his teaching, but the second thing that astonishes them is there's a man present who has a demon or an unclean spirit in him. So let's say something about demons. 
Um, we don't have a, any passage in, in Scripture that, that lays out in a systematic form an explanation of demonology, if you will, or of, especially of this phenomenon of demons possessing people during the first century and, and leading up to this time that Jesus is on the earth. We simply do not know, like synagogues, when this began. We don't know any of the real deep details about the nature of demon possession. All we have are episodes or stories of Jesus or even the apostles um, casting demons out or words that they speak, as on this occasion, in order to try to understand something about the phenomenon. And even that certainly does not answer all of our curiosity about it. What we do see is that Jesus uh, has miraculous power over these demons to cast them out and to relieve people who are troubled by them. That's one thing also we learn in these stories, that people who were demon-possessed were miserable. They were self-abusive. They abused others as well. They were living um, awful lives. They, some of them could not even be in uh, mixed company with others. They were so vicious or violent. They were out of control of their body functions. In this case, you see demons speaking through the man they are possessing. So in some way, they had the ability to control the, the vocal uh, ability of someone that they were possessing. And so as the man's vocal cords actually are physically working, it's not him speaking, it is the demon. We also see here that the demons are, are challenging Jesus. Um, they, uh, they wonder about his presence among them. Um, first of all, they say, let us alone. We don't want you troubling us. You know, the, the book of Jude, verse 6, there's only one chapter, but Jude, verse 6, talks about demons being held under uh, chains and re, uh, restrained by God until uh, their judgment to come in the future, a time of their condemnation. And so it seems that the, the spirits here in this man are challenging Jesus on this basis. Let us alone. What do we have to do with you? Did you come to destroy us? They seem to understand this is not the ultimate end of them, but they don't understand at this point, not being omniscient, why Jesus is confronting them. So we have this very interesting episode of sort of the spiritual world and the physical world meeting. The demons being allowed seemingly for a small period of time to inhabit physical bodies in this world uh, and, and retain uh, their uh, identity as demons. And then here's Jesus in the flesh. They seem obviously to know Jesus from the other world, the spiritual world. And so they're questioning what he has to do with them at this point in time. And so Jesus just simply says, be quiet. I don't want you testifying for me or of me. I don't want you speaking on my behalf. They had just said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so they, I, I, say, I say they, it's only mentioned the singular here. The demon says, I know who you are. And so Jesus says, be quiet. I don't want you speaking on my behalf. And so he orders the demon to come out, and, and it does so, but in, in a horrible fashion. There's convulsing and loud crying out, and the demon comes out. It's a very horrible thing to contemplate. And so, again, we don't know that much about the details of demon possession we might be able to extrapolate a few things from what we read about these episodes in Scripture, but it generally leaves us with more questions than we have answers for. The one thing that is interesting here is the people's response to Jesus casting out these demons. We have other um, indications in the New Testament that Jews were trying to solve this problem of demon possession on their own, and, and they were not effective in doing it. So when Jesus actually cast the demon out, they're astounded. They don't know what to think of this kind of power. They say, what new doctrine is this? It's interesting they tied Jesus exercising the demon to what he was saying. What is this man teaching? Because he's backing it up with miraculous ability. We don't understand all of this, but maybe we should listen to it. He even commands the unclean spirits to come out and they obey him. And so again, we have 
another couple of instances here of our word immediately. Immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. We saw it again back up in verse 21. Immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue. So it's an action-packed book. We find now that the, the knowledge of Jesus is beginning to radiate outward more from Galilee than Judea and Jerusalem. His fame is going to be centered on Galilee again because this is where most of his work will be done. Uh, let me slow down a moment. I think I skipped over a few questions here. So let's go to the top of page two of your notes. And this actually goes back to the passage in Luke 5. And I, I mentioned that uh, because that's a passage that gives us more detail about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew uh, and James and John from their fishing business. And so Luke 5 tells a little bit more about this. And our question is, what confidence does Peter show in Jesus and where did it come from? Well, in Luke 5, the, the disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, John, had been fishing all night and caught nothing. And Jesus, as they're now cleaning and mending their nets, as we find out, Jesus says, push your boats out a little bit offshore and cast your nets down, and you'll, you'll have a catch. And so Peter agrees to do that, though it would have obviously been more work. They had been working all night. This is what Peter says. We, we've, we've fished all night and caught nothing, but nevertheless, at your word, we'll put out the nets. And when they do, their, their nets are uh, overflowing with fish. And so, again, we don't necessarily see this background of the time they've spent with Jesus. So the question was, where did their confidence come from? Well, they've already seen Jesus work miracles before that. They had seen Jesus turn the water into wine, for example, in Cana. They had seen the other miracles that Jesus did in Jerusalem. They had seen Jesus do a variety of things, and this is where Peter got his confidence to go ahead and put the nets back out after all night of fruitless fishing at the word of a carpenter, not a fisherman. And then our next question, how does the great power of Jesus make uh, Peter feel on this occasion? Luke 5, 8, Peter was ashamed of himself and felt guilty about his sins. He fell down at Jesus' feet and said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And so this power just completely uh, brings Peter to submission. And of course, Jesus has not come to exercise that power to drive men away, but actually to draw them to himself. And so this is something Peter has to learn, and he will over the next two to three years. Then what greater purpose does Jesus have for them, Luke 5.10? To make them fishers of men. That's what he's intent on doing. I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to leave this literal fishing business, and I'm going to send you out to catch men in the net of the kingdom, if you will. All right, let's, uh, let's look at... Our next question uh, further down in our notes here. Um, what astonished the people in addition to the miracles of Jesus? Mark 1, 22 and 27, his teaching. Jesus is doing uh, miraculous things, but they're never uh, the main attraction. They're only to gain a hearing. It's the words of Jesus that are designed to make the most impact. The miracles are not going to last forever. They're not designed to be the big draw, although Jesus knows what will happen in working miracles. People will be drawn to him as we see beginning to happen in the passage we just read. But Jesus doesn't want the people to focus on the miracles. He wants them to focus on his words. And then I asked a question looking ahead. In spite of this initial euphoria in Capernaum, how does this town react ultimately to Jesus. And if you go to Matthew 11, verse 23, you're going to see that he condemns them for their unbelief. So let's not be misled here. What Jesus is doing is showing an early popularity among the people, but it isn't going to last. And so this, this is, is going to head downhill fairly quickly as word begins to spread that Jesus is working miracles, and then the Pharisees and the scribes begin to get involved in this, and they begin to oppose Jesus and challenge his teaching and ultimately lay plans against him to take his life. Now, let's pick up our reading again in verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. 
So again, we've got our word immediately. It's actually the same word in Greek as the phrase at once at the end of verse 30. But this is a story uh, on a more personal note, if you will, of Jesus healing someone um, close to him. This would be Peter's mother-in-law. And so again, we're in Capernaum. Peter and Andrew were actually from a town north of here called Bethsaida. But now this passage mentions a house belonging to Simon and or Peter and Andrew. We don't know any more about that, whether they had recently relocated from Bethsaida to Capernaum, whether it was a second house that they owned. It's really, it's not said. But it's at that venue that Jesus then comes in after uh, casting the demon out of the man in the synagogue, only to find Peter's mother-in-law ill with a fever. And the, the emphasis of this, I think, is the suddenness with which she is restored to health. Uh, Jesus lifts her from her sickbed, takes her by the hand, immediately the fever left her, and she served them, indicating no residual uh, side effects of some kind of a high fever or whatever illness would have come with it. And so again, this is adding to the growing influence and the popularity and the knowledge of Jesus. On the same day then, pick up the reading in verse 32, at evening, and remember this has been the Sabbath day, so now at evening the Sabbath ends because under Jewish timekeeping, the day changed at evening, not at midnight like on our calendar. So at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Again, similar to what he says in verse 25 to the demon in the synagogue, be quiet. Here we have Jesus not allowing the demons to speak. You know, sometimes there are people that you just don't want speaking for you. It may be that they have a dubious character. They're not looked upon well by others, and by mentioning your name, you kind of get tied to them, and Jesus doesn't want that. And he doesn't want himself to be known prematurely anyway. And we'll see that in uh, an episode following here. So Jesus doesn't want, for whatever reason or reasons, Jesus doesn't want uh, the demon speaking on his behalf. And so here we see, again, just the people in Capernaum besiege Jesus as soon as the Sabbath is over. And this tells us how fruitless medical treatment was at the time, how impossible uh, demon exorcisms were. It had to be done by miracle. It was not going to be done by someone other than Jesus or whom Jesus endows with such power. And so the people are desperate. They're living in horrible conditions. They don't have the medical treatment that we have today. And so they're desperate for healing for themselves and their loved ones, and they come bringing them in mass. Now, after that wonderful evening of Jesus serving the people, verse 35, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. So Jesus is missing from the house. The disciples arise early in the morning. He's not there. He's gotten up before daylight, and he's going out to pray. We're already beginning to see some stress in Jesus' life and the need to be away and apart from the crowds and spend time with his Father. And if that was true of Jesus, how much more is it true of us? We need to spend time with God too, and we're not busier than Jesus. He had to make time. We have to make time. He carved that time out, at least on this occasion and others we will read about. He carved out that time early in the morning before anybody else was up. We need to find our alone time with God whenever that may be possible in our busy daily routines. And so Peter and the others come out, and Peter kind of speaks for the rest. Well, what are you doing out here? Everybody's looking for you. And Jesus said, I'm not going back into Capernaum right now. We're going to go to the next towns, and we're going to travel about. Jesus didn't come and just wait for people to come to him. He went out to them. Not everybody would be able to make such a journey. And so he went out 
and this would be the first of several tours around the towns and villages of Galilee that he's going to make or send out his disciples to do as well. But he's going to saturate Galilee with this teaching of the kingdom and healing those that are afflicted of one ailment or another. And so Jesus said, I've come forth for this purpose, and we've got to be busy about that work. And so Jesus was preaching in their synagogues, verse 39, throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. That brings us to the last episode of this chapter, beginning in verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Well, as Jesus is traveling around Galilee, a man who is a leper comes to him. Now, lepers would not only have been in great distress physically, but they were socially excluded. They could not live with their families and interact with people and work regular jobs. They mostly were uh, relegated to leper colonies, and, and people would only feed them out of humanitarian concern. It would have been a horrible uh, ailment to have in that period of time. And yet this leper, who knew of no cure in his own day, came to Jesus, knelt down, and said, If you're willing, you can make me clean. He doesn't question Jesus' ability, but he questions his willingness. He doesn't assume anything. He shows Jesus deference, kneeling down at, at his feet. If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I am willing. Be cleansed. That simple. You know, when you have the power that Jesus had, when you were God in the flesh, you could speak to a demon and it would be gone. You could speak to leprosy and it would be healed. Quite an astounding miracle. I mean, all miracles are astounding. But this is such an, a horrible ailment in that time. And for Jesus to speak, and if you might imagine, I don't know how far this man's leprosy went, but if you've seen pictures of people with leprosy, it's, it's horrendous and it's disfiguring and your fingers rot away, your toes rot away, and your extremities just begin rotting up towards your, the trunk of your body. It's a horrible malady. And Jesus simply heals him with a spoken word and then says, go fulfill your obligations according to the law of Moses. Even though Jesus is preaching about a new and spiritual kingdom that's coming that he's establishing, the law of Moses is still in effect. And Jesus said not one jot or tittle of that law would be taken away until all is fulfilled, and it's not fulfilled yet. Jesus is in the process of doing so, but he's not fulfilled the law yet. And so the man is directed to keep what the law required, and as a testimony to the priests who would make offering for him, demonstrate who Jesus was and who had this healing power. On the one hand, we might say it's understandable that in his exuberance, the man didn't follow Jesus' directions. But on the other hand, he didn't follow Jesus' directions. He did not obey. He didn't do what Jesus said he should do. And this creates problems for Jesus. Word begins to spread all the more. Jesus never is at a loss for publicity. But the more people talked about these things, the more difficult life was for him and for people trying to get close to him and hear his teaching or receive a healing. And so the man does not obey. It says he, he began to proclaim it freely and spread the matter. And so disobedience comes in various forms. Here, it, we might say it came with good intentions, but that didn't justify disobeying what Jesus actually said. When, when God gives us orders and commands, we need to follow them as best we can and not decide that something else or some alternative uh, idea or plan on our part 
would work just as well. Well, let's wrap up our study there today. We'll go on into chapter 2 and the first part of chapter 3, which is what is outlined in, uh, in lesson 2 here. We'll, we'll undertake that in our study on Sunday at 6.30. This is a recording uh, because I have other obligations this Wednesday night. But back to Sunday, uh, we'll be live streaming again. And so we hope to see you then and have a good rest of the week. Thanks for joining us.